We have a difficult subject this afternoon. We are in a world that is constantly being divided. We divide along racial lines. We divide along political lines. We divide along linguistic lines and ethnic lines and a host of anything else that we could possibly use to divide us in our society we use. But it's not enough simply to divide anymore. We have to villainize the opposition so that anyone who disagrees with our point of view, anyone who doesn't share the way we look at the world, they're the enemy. And we go on the attack, whether it's on social media, whether it's on the news talk shows that we can watch pretty much all the time or newspaper columns, we see people constantly attacking. The world is so divided. The world encourages us to make snap judgments about people based on almost no information at all. How can we live in a world like this and find the impartiality of Jesus Christ? I want you to read with me the words of Galatians chapter 3. This is where we're going to begin. And we'll move from there to look at a number of examples in Scripture ultimately concentrating on James chapter 2. But as we begin, I want us to think about the fact that the world may be divided. The world may not see, to, see eye to eye. The world may want to make enemies out of the opposition. But we're not of the world. In the book of Galatians chapter 3, the Bible says, beginning in verse 28, there is neither... Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all what? One in Christ Jesus. Do you see that? The world may be divided. The world may villainize the opposition. The world may look at us versus them, but we are not part of the world. We are in Jesus Christ. And through the blood of Jesus Christ, when we are going under the waters of baptism, our sins are washed away, but so is our identity. We come out of that water different people than when we enter. We are transformed by the saving power of God. And all the boundary lines, all the borders that separate us are erased. There may be people in our world who don't speak our language, but guess what? They can be brothers in Christ. There may be people in our world who didn't grow up with our experiences, but guess what? They can be brothers in Christ. There may be people who have never stepped foot in the United States of America, but guess what? They can be brothers in Christ. You know why? Because there is only one man in Jesus Christ. All the boundaries are erased. All that separates us is set aside by the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do we understand what this passage is communicating to us? That it doesn't matter how much money you make, what your level of education is, how long you've been a Christian, when you are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, you are a new creature. That's the key to understanding the doctrine of impartiality as lived by Jesus Christ. Why doesn't our world see it? Why can't our world become better by the saving power of Jesus Christ? In the words of an author by the name of Olivier Clement, he said, spiritual progress has no other test in the end, nor any better expression than our ability to love. That's all it amounts to. When we learn to love like Jesus, we begin to look like Jesus. When we are transformed by His power, we don't see people as enemies. We see them as brothers and sisters. An opportunity is there for all of us to come into one body in Jesus Christ. But love can only come from a depth of understanding that is forged in the crucible of experience. Unless you have learned to live where people are, you cannot possibly learn to love the way Jesus did. When I was in the third grade, I had a wonderful teacher. Her name is Miss Thomason. Miss Thomason went, uh, went, went into class one day and she wrote on the board this word, prejudice. Now, in third grade, I didn't know what the word prejudice meant. 
I'm not sure if any of my classmates knew what the word prejudice meant. But she proceeded to divide the class up into two groups. Let's call them the haves and the have-nots. She put me in the group of the have-nots. And for that day, the haves were able to get everything. Whenever we went to lunch, the haves were allowed to talk during lunch, and they had no time limit. They could get any food they want. The have-nots were forced to eat in silence, and we were given only minimal food. When it came time for recess, the haves were allowed to play anywhere, and their recess wasn't timed. The have-nots were allowed to play on one piece of equipment, and we only got an abbreviated recess. When it came time for the afternoon snack, the haves received a full-size candy bar and a soda. The have-nots received a saltine cracker and a cup of water. Talk about oppression. Throughout that day, we began to formulate theories among ourselves. The have-nots would band together and, and try to figure out what it was that we did to deserve this. And we began to villainize the haves. And then they began to do something interesting too. Just in a few hours of this experience, they began to look down upon us, to view themselves as superior, as somehow deserving the treatment they were receiving while we deserve to be oppressed, the victims of injustice. Now, I'm talking about third grade kids here. It doesn't take long to become a culture, does it? Guess what happened on the next day? We switched groups. And all of a sudden, the have-nots from the day before sought our revenge. What we learned something, uh, we learned something during that little demonstration. And that is we learned what it means to feel the way that other people feel. In a way that we never would have learned before, I think. We learned to know what it meant to be superior, and we learned what it meant to be inferior. I've never forgot those lessons. And so oftentimes, I think what we do is we look at the world in terms of two categories. Sociologists sometimes call this tribal thinking. There is us and there is them. There are two groups of people, and, and we are who we are, and we try to maintain our identity. There are Jews and there are Samaritans, right? There are whites and there are blacks. There are rich and there are poor. And we want to maintain our group identity. We don't want to be like them. Oh, we, all, we already know all about them. We understand them. This kind of thinking only leads to more dysfunction and more oppression. It breeds partiality. Our society has tried this for far too long, and it isn't working. It isn't working in our world, and it won't work in the church. But what we did in the 1940s and 50s is we initiated a different kind of model. One that began to show signs of progress. It's what we might call cooperational thinking. It's one where we recognize, yes, there is still an us and there is still a them, but we can cooperate. We can talk with one another. We can work with one another on certain projects. In fact, it may be that we even allow ourselves to play on the same athletic teams and go to the same schools and be involved in the same civic organizations. We can cooperate, but we still recognize there, there are these two groups. This has been the way our society has functioned since the Civil Rights Movement, more or less. And in the Lord's Church, this is often how we still function today. We're still divided. We still know all about them, and we think we know about us. We'll cooperate. We're civil. We maintain relationships. This is not the kind of church the Lord intended. Here's the model we read about in Galatians chapter 3. There is not an us and a them. If we want to learn to think with impartiality the way that Jesus did, we've got to stop this us and them stuff. There's just us. 
We've all been bought by the blood of Jesus. We're all guilty of sin. No matter where we were born, no matter what your level of education or income, it's just us. Jesus Christ died for all of us the same way. This shows up in our reading of Scripture. Look at Luke chapter 10, if you would. And let's examine this passage with this perspective in mind. In Luke chapter 10, this is the well-known parable of the Good Samaritan. And you know that this parable is prompted by a question. It's not a bad question, by the way. The lawyer, which we would translate that into our culture as a Bible scholar, it doesn't mean somebody who is a professional lawyer, it means someone who is a professional student of the Word of God, as it was known at the time, the Mosaic Law. But the, the, the Bible scholar says, I've got a question. Who is my neighbor? You see, if you look back at Leviticus chapter 19, verses 17 and 18, you'll see something. That there are three different expressions that are used in that context to refer to the person to whom you are to show kindness. One of them is the Hebrew word brother. Now, if I read that word, I'm thinking, oh, well, that's a fellow Jew, right? My brother, if I am a Jew living under the Mosaic law, is a fellow Jew. The second word is one of the sons of your own people. Well, that also sounds like a fellow Jew. But the third word, which is the most ambiguous of all three words, is the word neighbor. And the question is, what does the word neighbor mean? By the way, this is a question that is debated in the Jewish writings. This is not an idea that is being asked for the first time in Luke chapter 10. It was a very common exegetical question. And so the lawyer doesn't ask a foolish question. He asks actually a pretty good question. What does the word neighbor mean? Now, his question is motivated by an us versus them kind of thinking. To whom, as a Jew living under the Mosaic law, can I refuse to show, show kindness and still be compliant with the law of God? Isn't that the way that, that some of us think today? What is the most I can get away with and not violate God's law? That's his question. So Jesus tells the story of a priest who comes by, sees a person in need, and passes on by. He sees a, a, a Levite who comes by, and of course the Levite passes on by. And then finally, the Samaritan. And of course the question is asked, which one proved to be a neighbor? And you know the lawyer answers that question by saying, well, I guess the one who showed him kindness. And so we stop the story there most of the time, don't we? What we do with that story is we say, well, you see, the neighbor is one of them. The neighbor is the Samaritan. The neighbor wasn't a Jew. He was a Samaritan. Us versus them. But notice that's not where Jesus stops. Would you look with me? You know this, this is in the Bible. I'm not surprising anybody, I'm sure. But would you read with me the final words of Jesus from verse 37? Read it with me, please. Jesus said to him, what? You go and do like... Now we read right over that much of the time. Or at least I used to. What we do is we say, well... well we know who the neighbor is. The neighbor is the Samaritan. Jesus' point is not whether we can identify the neighbor. His point is whether we will be the neighbor. The point Jesus is making is that this Jewish scholar doesn't understand what the word neighbor means in Leviticus 19.18. It's whether he's willing to do what it takes to be the neighbor. One of the things that I, that I see a lot in our religious world is people on social media know all the, all the answers. They know how to fix the church. They know all the angles. But they're unwilling to actually do it. You see, there, there are no shortage of answers in our religious world, are there? I mean, I mean I, I've got all kinds of answers, don't you? <laughs> Question is, who's willing to actually step up and do it? Oh, we know how to figure out this problem uh, of racial division... We know how to solve the problem of political division, but who's willing to do the hard work to make it happen? 
That's what we're talking about here today. We've got to be willing to be the neighbor. Not just know who the neighbor is, but be the neighbor. Look at James chapter 2. And we'll spend the remainder of the time we have here. And don't worry, I am cognizant of the fact that I am standing between you and good food. And so I will take that into consideration as we look at this text today. But James chapter 2, I want you to begin looking with me in verse number 1. The Bible says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Notice there is a rule laid down here. The rule is, and of course it's very difficult to follow the rule sometimes, the rule is don't be partial. Show no partiality. The word partiality really means to lift up the face. It's thought to come from the ancient custom when people would bow before a king or a dignitary with their faces to the ground, refusing even to lift up their eyes because they were unworthy to look upon the dignity of someone in a high position. But if the king or in the Old Testament, if the Pharaoh wanted to communicate with one of his servants, he would reach down and lift up his head. I don't know if you sing the song here about God as the lifter of my head. It's a beautiful image. But the concept is that some people treat others that way. You treat others with partiality. Where they, they are such people that they ought to avert their eyes because we're so important. So the rule is show no partiality. The problem is there's a reality involved. Look at verses 2 through 4 of James 2. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Notice we've got a rule But we also have a reality. Just like we see in our culture today, we we tend to know the right thing to do, but it's much more difficult to do it. In the church, already in the first century, there is a prejudice toward the rich. The gold ring was a signal of wealth. Uh, Most of us, at least those of us who are married, wear a ring of gold on our hands. I have one here. Uh, And uh, many of you do as well. We don't think about that as being that important. But remember in the parable of the lost son, when the son returns home, a great feast was held, the fatted calf was killed. And do you remember what the father says? Bring the ring and put it on his finger. Rings were only worn by wealthy people and then only for special occasions. So we have the image here of these wealthy people who are all dressed up. And they come into the church to kind of see what things are like. To get a sense of what's going on here in this new religious movement. Kind of showing off their wealth. You've been in situations perhaps, I know I have, where a person of importance walks in the door. And people begin to look. Do, 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 you, know, do you know who that is? A few weeks ago, uh, President David Shannon, I think he's visited here before, I understand. President of Freed Hardeman, he was passing by on a Wednesday night. And uh, the church where I preach is right off a main highway in Tennessee. And so he pulled over and he came in the back door right before Bible class and sat down. I got four texts during the announcements. The president is here. I was looking at my phone thinking, what, what am I supposed to do with this information? You know, I don't know what to do here. But someone important is in the building. What are we going to do? How are we going to treat this person? And of course, uh, after the services, several people went up and talked to him. He was very nice. But you understand that this is something we deal with even today. If that person had been someone from the community, no one knew, how many people would have sent me a message? How many people would have stood in line to talk to that person after services were over? I'm going to tell you it would have been the same number, but I don't know whether that's true or not. The fact is, we tend to treat people who are wealthy and important with far more honor than just a regular old visitor. Why do we do that? Are we not showing partiality among ourselves? 
when we make those distinctions. Notice there's not only in the church a prejudice toward the rich, but also a prejudice against the poor. The word James uses for shabby clothing in this verse is the same word he uses in James 1 and verse 21 when he tells the church to put away all filthiness. The word filthiness is the word used to describe clothing. Have you ever seen somebody come in the, the back doors and maybe they sit on the back row and their clothes are kind of dirty and maybe they look like they, they don't really belong in a worship service with the rest of us. Have you ever noticed that before? And how many people say, well, should, should we talk to that person? Or what, 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 which, what should we do here? They're a visitor and we don't know them and they, they look funny and they kind of smell funny and, and who's going to be the first person to go talk to them? This is true even in the church today, isn't it? Sometimes we try to behave as though we're so civilized because we have all this education and all this information and all this understanding. The church hasn't really changed a whole lot in the last 2,000 years. Because I fear, if we're honest with ourselves, many of us would respond exactly the way James describes here. The fact of the matter is, we ought to be better. Isaac of Nineveh once said these words, Make no distinction between rich and poor. Do not try to find out who is worthy and who is not. Let all people be equal in your eyes. Thus you will be able to influence even the unworthy for the good. One of the most remarkable statements that I find in the Gospels is made on a number of occasions. He received tax collectors and sinners and ate with them. I haven't had a lot of people who had a reputation for being wicked in my house lately. How about you? I don't think I've had a lot of people with a reputation of being wicked in the town of Lexington in our church lately. How about you? Jesus made it a point to go out and seek the lost. He went out looking for those people, trying to help those people, and surely not everybody with whom Jesus shared a meal was willing to repent. Not everybody turned from a life of sin and rushed to the gospel of grace. Not everybody. A number of those people remained in their sins and refused to change. You see, one of the things that makes the church special is the boundary lines that exist out there. They don't exist in here. The, the distinctions that you find, the partiality, the judgment, the injustice, all those things that are a problem out there, they're not a problem in here. Or at least they're not supposed to be. We see that in the church, already in the first century, you run into those problems. How are we doing it differently? What are we doing to intentionally cultivate relationships among people who don't look the way we look, who may not think the way we think, who don't know what we know? Are we perpetuating an us versus them paradigm? Or are we trying to bring people into the Lord's church? allowing them to be taught and bought by His blood and grace. Notice James turns. Instead of talking about what they're doing, he begins to talk about what the Lord Himself does. Notice in verses 5 through 7, the Bible says these words, Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith? and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones those who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? One of the things I learned when I was in high school, I was doing uh, mission work in the Caribbean. And we would go door knocking around these islands for a gospel meeting we would have. And whenever we would go with the locals, there were certain areas I noticed that we tried to avoid. And, and uh, I just asked one gentleman one day, I said, why, why haven't we ever gone down this street? We've, we've door knocked every house around this one street, but we haven't gone down this street. And he said, you see that, that house right there on the corner? And it was kind of up on a hill. And I said, yes. And it had a gate around it. It was a little bit nicer, a little bit larger. There was a Land Rover in the driveway. He said, those people are rich. 
they don't hear the gospel. Now, I don't know if he was being fair in that judgment or not, but they learned something by experience. That generally speaking, those who are wealthy do not feel the need for Jesus. Those who are wealthy do not respond to the gospel. It's those who have nothing else to live for, who are disenfranchised and they're hopeless. Remember when Jesus looked at the people, the crowds coming to him, and the Bible says he had compassion because they were like what? Sheep without a shepherd. These were people who had no direction in life. They had no leadership in life. They had nowhere to go. Those are the people who were most drawn to Jesus. So oftentimes, the very people we try to target with our gospel are those least likely to receive it. And we never go to those who are most hungry for it. The Bible teaches us that God honors the poor. Notice in the book of Job, chapter 34, Elihu is speaking, describing God, and his words are right on here when he says about the Lord that he shows no partiality to princes, nor regards the rich more than the poor, for they are all the work of his hands. The Bible says when God breathed into the nostrils of man the breath of life, that was the last value statement he made. God, after that point, doesn't make value statements anymore. Oh, you're a king? Well, well, let me give you just a little bit more mercy. Oh, you're a prince? Let me give you just a little bit more grace. No, that's not how it works. If you are made in the image of God, you are a soul precious in His sight. When we begin to see the world the way God sees the world, we see every human being as valuable. The problem is, so often, I don't. I make the judgments and distinctions according to my worldview. I want to be around people who think like me and look like me and act like me. I'm unwilling to reach outside my comfort zone to see the value of a soul. When we put on God's glasses, we see the world differently. He doesn't regard rich and poor differently. Notice the Bible says in 1 Samuel 2 and verse number 8, He raises up, again speaking of the Lord, He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. It is the work of God to take those who are broken and fragile and in need and give them everything they need to empower those who are powerless. One of the things that we learn throughout the Psalms is if you want God's attention, you portray yourself, you represent yourself to Him as though you are poor and needy. Have you noticed something that's funny about the, gospel, or about the Psalms, though? That oftentimes you'll read the words, a Psalm of David, right? A Psalm of David, and then just two lines later, I am poor. No, you're not, you're the king. <laughs> Every single bit of the revenue of ancient Israel went into the palace of King David. He's not poor. Why does he call himself poor? Because he's in need. No matter how wealthy we, we may be, no matter how well-equipped we may be, all of us are in need of the power and mercy of God. And if we don't think about that every day of our lives, we are not thinking spiritually enough. In Luke chapter 6 and verse number 20, Jesus says, as he's looking at his disciples, he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Notice in Luke's version, it's not poor in spirit, it's just poor, full stop. Blessed are you who are poor, because you know what it means to rely on a strength greater than yourself. You know what it means to be in need, and you can understand the desperation it takes to be a child of God. Just a, a session before, Brother Mosier talked about Romans chapter 12, and how Paul said that we need to become living sacrifices... Think about that terminology for a moment. A sacrifice is by definition something that is killed. The problem with living sacrifices, as one author said, is that they're always trying to crawl off the altar. As living sacrifices, it's hard to put ourselves to death and allow God to live in us. But if we want to understand what it means to learn to lean on God, we must be willing to impoverish ourselves and to see the value in others. And there's implications for human beings in living the life that God lives. But also notice James says that the rich tend to persecute the faithful. 
Gregory of Nazianzus once said, humanity has nothing so much in common with God as the ability to do good. But so often what we find is that people don't use what they have to do good. They use what they have to enrich themselves, to, to acquire for themselves everything they want instead of doing what perhaps he would want. Notice the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse number 7, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is the slave of the lender. Does that sound like modern times? Look a few verses later in verse 16 of Proverbs 22. Whoever oppresses the poor to increase his own wealth or gives to the rich will only come to poverty. The fact is that whenever we try to ingratiate ourselves to those who are rich, we're by and large trying to get in with a group who doesn't care much about us. Whenever in the first century world you wanted to get ahead, most of the time there wasn't an opportunity for upward mobility. See, we've got this thing figured out in the modern times. And uh, uh, we tell students, I guess, whenever they're about, what, seventh or eighth grade, uh, you need to choose whether you're going to go to college or technical school or whatever. And so by the time they start high school, we've got them on a certain track. We're pointing them in a direction. And what we tell them is, if you go to college and you get a degree, when you get out, you're going to get the job you want and you're going to make lots of money and then you're going to be successful, which, by the way, being successful means making a lot of money. And then now we're dealing with an entire generation of people who found out that isn't true. 33% of Americans go to college. 25% can't get a job in their field after college. The American dream has become a nightmare for an entire generation of people. And so they're wondering what's going on. Why have we lied to them? Why have we told them something that isn't true? You see, we've taught them the wrong definition of what success means. We've taught them that success means that you're powerful and important and influential and wealthy. Rather than teaching them, success means that you lean on God and you trust in Him for everything you have. One of the things that we try to teach our children every single day, my wife and I, she's better at it than I am, but we try to teach our children that your life today needs to be lived in order to make somebody else's day better. The last thing I tell them before they get out of the vehicle to go into school, and I, now I don't even tell them, I have them tell me, but I say, what does daddy always tell you? Make somebody else's day better. That's right. And you better go make it happen. So oftentimes, we're in a world where everybody's got blinders on. Oh, I'm just going to get what's best for me, and I'm going to do for me, because I'm not worried about anybody else. That's the reason society's in the mess it's in. If we all look for opportunities to enrich the lives of other people, enrich their lives with our attention, with our kindness, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're not only going to see our churches fill up beyond capacity, we're going to see our world change Communities will look different. States will look different. The nation will look different. But we've got to be willing to take that step. To begin to view other people, maybe even people who don't look the way we look, with value. To honor them for the people they are made in the image of God. In fact, true wealth lies with God. And we're just distributing what he has already given to us. If I am a recipient of grace, I must be a distributor of grace. But then, thirdly, notice there is the threat of judgment that we find in this text. Back in James chapter 2, if you look at verses 8 through 13, there's not a clock in here. Is, is that strategic? Um, <laughs> what time am I supposed to quit? Okay, I'm, I'm doing uh, fine then. All right, verses 8 through 13 of James chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says. So we've talked about what's going on in the church, and we see James doesn't approve. We've talked about what goes on in God's mind to see the, way, uh, see the world the way God sees the world. Now look at verse number 8. If you really fulfill the royal law, James says, according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. 
For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. But mercy triumphs over judgment. Notice there are several points that are made here. Number one, partiality violates the royal law. It's interesting that when Jesus is asked about the greatest commandments, uh, He says, of course, the first one is to love the Lord, uh, right? And the second one is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Notice there is a vertical responsibility and a horizontal responsibility. If I don't love God, then I'm not going to love anyone else. If I don't love anyone else, I'm not going to love God. It's very simple. John explains this in 1 John chapter 1. If we are walking in the light as He is in the light, we have what? You tell me. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of cleanses us from all sin. If I am doing what I need to be doing with my brothers and sisters, then my relationship with God is going to be what it needs to be. But if I'm not, I can't have a relationship with the Lord. You see, life in Christ is lived holistically. So oftentimes we have people who try to claim to love God, but there's no evidence of that love in their lives. Partiality violates the royal law because it devalues everyone else. Or at least everyone who isn't worthy of my affection. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 29, the Bible gives us a hint of what it's like to love others as yourself. Paul says, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Nobody loves you like you. That's probably a true statement. Nobody loves you like you do. You take care of yourself in a way that no one else will. You look after your interests in a way that no one else will. You think more highly of yourself than most other people do. It's human nature. So if we learn to love other people like ourselves, think about what that means. It means that I am looking for opportunities to serve others just as often as I serve myself. I look for opportunities to feed others just as often as I'm thinking about feeding myself. When I go out to buy clothing for myself, I'm also thinking about others who might be in need of clothing to buy for them as well. One of the things that has happened in my life that has been transformative is a, going to the church where I now work. I have never seen a congregation do more for poor in the community. And I have to be honest, can I, can I confess a bit of a sin on my part? My assumption before is that people were poor because they didn't want to work. Isn't that awful that I thought that? That the reason why people were poor is because they didn't want to work. And if they would just bother to take the time to get the government's aid, they would be fine. So what, why do we have poor people anyway? What a shame that was. What I've learned is there's an entire population of people in Lexington, Tennessee, a little old town of Lexington, Tennessee. They're mentally handicapped. They can't take care of themselves. They don't even know how to get the help that might be available to them. They are dependent upon the grace and generosity of other people to survive. And we've got wonderful brothers and sisters in our congregation. In our congregation itself, we spend thousands of dollars a year to make sure those people have what they need. Our young people just had a clothing drive to provide clothes, coats, socks, various items for that whole population of people, about a hundred of them every month, we serve in a special way. Now those people are people, they're not going to be in the newspaper. They're not going to be on the nightly news being interviewed and the church is getting a lot of credit for, wow, look at what we're doing. That's not why anybody's doing it. But I learned a lesson. I learned a lesson there's an entire population of people out there who are slipping through the cracks 
Nobody cares about them and nobody is serving them, including the government. Who's going to step up? Will it be the Lord's church? To shower a world with kindness, a world that's never even seen kindness. To see dirty children who've never had a new pair of shoes receive a $20 pair of shoes from Target as though they're the greatest gift the world has ever seen. I've seen that look in a child's eyes. See, the fact is, when we make value judgments and we think we know all about them, we excuse ourselves from showing the love of Christ. And let us remind ourselves, as James tells us, that the violation of the law to love thy neighbor as thyself, it's sin. And we could do better. Notice also at the end of this passage, James tells us that judgment is falling on those who fail to keep the law of God. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 15, these words, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. There is a direct correlation between my being forgiven and my ability to forgive others. If I'm unwilling to extend the grace of God to someone else, God is unwilling to extend that to me. The law of liberty is the law under which I live. How much liberty am I offering to others? In Matthew 7, verses 1 and 2, the Bible tells us, Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. There is a standard of judgment. The Bible does not say that we're not permitted to make judgments. It just says you better be careful because when you do, that same standard is used against you. I don't know about you, but I need all the grace I can get. I need every ounce of grace God has to give to cover my sins, my sins of commission and my sins of omission. If I need that grace, ought I be willing to extend that to others as well? When we serve others with impartiality, we learn what it means to share the love of Jesus Christ, a love that we cannot understand unless we're willing to stop viewing other people as other and start viewing them as ourselves. We only understand impartiality when we learn to love. It's interesting to me that the book that most emphasizes the difference that Jesus makes in the world is the book that also most emphasizes His humanity. The Bible teaches us in Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who was in all points tempted as we are, yet without what? Sin. Let us, therefore, boldly come to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Whenever God had a plan to save the world, He didn't think, well, I've got it all figured out. I'm going to do this for them. He sent His Son to let Him learn what it was like to live among human beings, to experience temptation and human frailty, to know what it was like to be the victim of injustice, to understand pain and grief and sorrow, to watch when people disappointed him time and time again. And only by living that experience could he learn to love as a human being. And only whenever he learned obedience to the things which he suffered was he then qualified to die. 100% God, innocent of all sin, but 100% man fully understanding all temptation. When we learn to live as other people live, then we can love as God loves. Thank you so much for your kind attention this afternoon.